Layered Insight is the industry's first embedded security approach for containers. Trusted by Global 1000 Enterprises to secure their containerized applications, it's the only solution that requires no root privileges, has zero dependency on the underlying infrastructure, and is fully portable across any container environment. Unified DevOps and SecOps, enabling the rapid development of containerized applications without worrying about security. To learn more, please visit layeredinsight.com forward slash ASW. Rapid7 powers the practice of SecOps. Using shared data, analytics, and automated workflows, SecOps unites IT, DevOps, and security teams to make security an outcome of innovation. Rapid7 combines technology, expertise, and advocacy to drive vulnerability management, application security, incident detection, and log management for more than 7,000 organizations worldwide. Power up your SecOps practice with a free trial at rapid7.com forward slash security weekly. Hard-coded credentials can be trouble, but not as much trouble as a vulnerable DevOps environment. If you want protection without the hassle of security slowing you down, CyberArk, the number one provider in privilege access security, has the solution for you. With CyberArk Conjure, developers can easily secure secrets across any DevOps toolchain or platform, whether your application runs in the cloud or on-premises. Eliminate the headaches of managing secrets and try Conjure open source for free with no strings attached. Visit conjure.org forward slash ASW to get started today. Welcome back, everyone, to Application Security Weekly. I am, again, very happy to be joined, uh, you know, for this segment as well by my illustrious co-host, Paul Asadorian, and a very special guest. Paul, go ahead and introduce our guest for today's segment. Thank you very much, Keith. I am very excited to welcome uh, to Application Security Weekly none other than Ron Gula. Uh, Ron's been in the security industry for longer than probably you want to care too, to too admit. Too long. Got yes. the gray hairs. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ron, uh, a little bit of a personal history. Ron uh, and I met uh, several years ago. Uh, long story short, Ron actually hired me for better or in, in different. For better. <laughs> for better, thank you. Uh, so Ron, I worked, uh, I worked for Ron at Tenable uh, Network Security for seven years. Um, and right after I left Tenable to basically do security. After you left, the coffee quality went down. It, yeah. <laughs> the coffee and cigars, it <laughs> just wasn't the same. Uh, so Ron left uh, Tenable. Uh, from his full-time role at Tenable, uh, and now does investing uh, as Gula Tech Ventures uh, with your wife, Cindy. That's right. That's right. And we think it's an adventure, so it's Gula Tech Adventures. That's right. <laughs> it's, well, it it certainly is an adventure. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, Ron's uh, here today to talk about kind of the evolution of uh, applications and application security, uh, and where you know Keith and I are very excited, uh, as our listeners should be, to get your insights as I mean, how many pitches a day are you, are you taking it's, and then research along with that for, you know, those investments. So you're really following the industry and the trends. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So when I was at Tenable, I started doing angel investing mm -hmm. and we were able to make investments in uh, companies like Contrast Security, which is a RASP mm -hmm. and also companies like StackRox, which is a Docker container type of yep. uh, auditing company. Sure. And uh, of course, Tenable does a thing or two with you know scanning websites, mm -hmm. scanning containers these days, and, and, and auditing that. So it's it's an amazing uh, problem that's out there that you know frankly the industry really hasn't uh, solved solved yet. Uh, but uh, I look at it really interesting. I mean, you, you go back to bare metal. So when I was at the NSA and we'd hack into an application, there was no virtual server, there was no cloud. It was just some Solaris box running this app that runs on uh, on on Unix. It's interesting to think that like that's in the past now <laughs> like I'm just like it right. seems we, like yesterday like everything that. really did run on bare metal that's right that's it, right and there's they still are i still run into organizations today who have you know they buy these big cpus these mm -hmm. big computers with like 128 cpus in them and they're that's what they're doing and for that application it's like the best solution versus virtualization or cloud or serverless we have to to do that here and i know that, that ties into uh, some of your uh, investments as well but uh, you know, here in the studio, we have, I'd love to virtualize and go serverless for everything, right? Mm -hmm. But here in the studio, I have to have physical machines that are connected to physical hardware mm -hmm. that help us execute the production. So I, I think that while everyone likes to think that everything's going to be in the cloud and everything's going to be in a container, there's still going to be a hefty share of the market that's in bare metal still that's running right. in your that's organization. Right. Well, so, well th think of how many organizations run COBOL, right? Like there are still a ton true. of companies out there hiring COBOL developers. And COBOL hasn't been developed mainstream for what, 20, 30, 40 years at this point? That's so, right. And these really amazing companies like MuleSoft uh, who hook old applications mm -hmm. and APIs together, 
are killing it because these old legacy apps aren't dying. They are being breathed into with life with faster CPUs and memory. Is that essentially because it just costs too much to rewrite all the code? It does. And, and I do this a lot because, so, so at, at Google Tech Adventures, we've invested in everything from bare metal all the way to serverless and, and a lot of data center things. So I talk to a lot of organizations who still have this old legacy stuff and I say, aren't you going to refactorize these things and mm -hmm. put them into containers and go serverless? And they're like, I would if I had like, you know, 10 engineers to code this right, thing. Right. And by the way, everything's working great right now. Mm -hmm. And we think we can go five more years, you know, eight more years mm -hmm. without having to do these things. So, mm -hmm. so why do them now? And if, and just doing it because it's better security isn't necessarily the best, no, the best reason, not. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, in, that's interesting. And so there's going to be a bunch of, bare metal still around for a long time. Um, what, what are some of the interesting solutions that help us with those uh, you know, in-house, on-premise yeah. type solutions? So, so the way I, I talk about it is, at the end of the day, you need to put your data somewhere. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if it's, is it running an application or storing a data? And when I think of bare metal, and you think of the problem of, okay, maybe I'm in the movie industry, and you've got petabytes of, I don't know, you know Harry Potter footage. You know, what's your long-term strategy to kind of kind of save that? So the reason we, one of the reasons we invest in a company called Racktop is they've got a great way of going into a data center and at a very, very low cost, storing all that data with all the goodness of a network attached storage system, but also having the flexibility of doing failover in the cloud and, mm -hmm. and, and, and that. So storing a large amount of data is still a big problem, right? And if somebody says, yeah, my long-term solution is putting it on Dropbox or Box and, you know, nothing against those kind of, 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 of companies, but if that's your long-term storage strategy, that's not the, 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 you know, but that might not be the best strategy for your, it, your company. Is that because the, your, the another company controls your data at that point? Hundreds of reasons, right? You've got political reasons, right? Can I store this data from Germany here in a data center in, yep. in the U.S.? Can I control my cost? Uh, if you look at other industries that are really regulated and really up and running, the airline industry, you see a lot of these companies like Southwest Airlines, they buy the cost of fuel ahead of the time. And they're not trying to get the best deal, they're trying to control the cost of their, their, their right. airplanes, right? right? And it's the same thing with IT. You can't have variable cost uh, you know, from yes. someplace like an Amazon or mm -hmm. a Google or, or that. So there's a lot of, a lot of reasons for that. Um, and then it's reliability. You know, is Amazon, is Google as, as, as big and, and, and well-designed as they are, is it good enough for a bank? And mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot of banks who have to, you know, make trades and, and, and you know, give access to their employees go, I don't know if they can do it as good as, as good as we can. So there's still a lot of reasons to not go into the cloud. Hey, for our websites, for your server, it's perfect, right? And, and Amazon's killing it because of that. But for every vertical, for every application, hard yeah, to see, hard to say. Yeah. Um, so then the other side of this is, is applications. Mm -hmm. And when you think about applications, you know, we, you do get a multiple going from bare metal to virtualization. And then people, you know, obviously they realize that you could actually get even a better multiple, uh, you know, applications to bare metal by containerizing. Like don't, mm -hmm. don't run 12 operating systems. If you need 12 apps, run 12 apps and, 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 and virtualize them. And that's great, but that adds a lot of complexity and you need to kind of refactor your applications. You can't take a you know, an IIS Windows web server mm -hmm. and containerize that, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really, people try to do that. It struggles on the Windows platform with, with containers. Now, it Keith, does. have you also seen that, that same struggle? So I know that um, they've been working very hard to actually make this more accessible. They hired Jesse Frizzell out of Kubernetes, uh, formerly out of Docker, to lead this charge in Azure for their, their cloud platform. So they've actually been making a lot of strides toward for making this better. I know that I think it was Windows 2016 or Windows Server 2016 actually ships with Docker by default. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are getting better. Uh, I know at my training class at DerbyCon for a number of people that we were using Docker containers for the vulnerable application environment mm -hmm. for the lab, uh, those that were on Windows had a little bit more of a difficult time than yeah. those that were on Linux or Mac. So thing. yeah, it's, yeah. it's still a problem, uh, but <laughs> it's getting better. And it's, it's great because, you know, the same way we would say, hey, take this complex, you know, Linux server, a LAMP stack, mm -hmm. and move your SQL database over here and the, the, the web server over here and maybe even load balance them. You know, that kind of complexity goes away when you have a, you know, a microservice, you know, APIs and Docker. I, I give the, that exact example, yeah. Ron, when I talk about uh, Docker, actually I'm going to be speaking in Source Boston about Docker mm -hmm. security. And I remember being in meetings when I worked for uh, a company, it was a lottery company actually, and we'd have these early 2000s, we'd have these design meetings, you know, and it would be just as you described, like, we want to separate our application. So we kind of spread our risk out a little and we want to load balance. So we want to have web servers, we want to have application servers and database servers. And then in between those, we want to have firewalls or other devices that 
are helping load balance, that are helping with security, and it gets very, you know, the whiteboard fills up pretty quickly. Right? And there's a lot of technology that you have to acquire mm -hmm. and install to make that happen. And now we look at container and microservices, and I'm like, it's the same principle, but I'm like, it's so much easier. It, it looks a lot easier, and it, in theory, it's cheaper to do that mm -hmm. than to maybe run a bunch of Windows computers and Linux computers and, 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 and patch them. However, in practice, we're not seeing a huge adoption of that. And I know probably to it's the complex. listeners. Developers yeah. have tool fatigue. There's a big learning curve. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've spent a lot of time, our developers here spent a lot of time. We ask Keith questions all the time, like, how do you do this? And there's no best practices that apply even to a large percentage of the industry. Mm -hmm. And it makes it very difficult because of that learning curve. And then there's some big problems, right? So the first big sort of religious problem is, do I refactorize, right? Can mm -hmm. I take my old way of perhaps, you know, coding against Cobalt and whatever is, is legacy, and then do I just start over again with, with, with something new? Another big religious debate is, do I have to lock in, right? Can I mm -hmm. go into, you know, Kubernetes? Do I run it on my own? Do I run on top of VMware? Do I do it with, with something that can do hybrid clouds? Do I go all in? Because at the end of the day, serverless security, it's a lot like a container at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Instead of running your own container, you're just giving it to Amazon. Right. You're kind of you're kind of locked in there. Uh, that's a, that's another huge decision a lot of people have mm -hmm. to uh, have to make. So there's all these sort of sort of things out there, and then something that just kind of came up, which I think is really interesting, is this concept of unikernels, where is that like a unicorn kernel? Like you, a kernel you is love a unicorn, it, right? <laughs> it's got a really big unit uh, <laughs> uh, on it. But um, if you think about an app, mm -hmm. uh, just think about it like a simple. Um, you know, a, a, a webhook or something like that. It waits for a URL, it does something and it gives you an answer. So you could containerize that and you're like, great, there's no Linux kernel to, to, to patch or, or no SSH daemon I can attack. It's just the API. Well, that still runs on top of Docker, which runs on top of a complex you Kern know, kernel. Yep. So the concept of unikernel is to basically say, take that app and then slice up the kernel mm -hmm. to only have a kernel that supports the app. So you kind of take Docker out of the equation mm -hmm. and you just have a computer, almost like a, a like a firmware, if you will, that just does this API thing. You don't have to patch it. So it's like a kernel that runs other kernels. Right. Without that uh, in between it, it literally is something that runs on top of bare metal. Yeah. So you have like a, a small hypervisor layer mm -hmm. and, it, and it runs these things. And the interesting thing is, is uh, a couple of things. You get a performance bump. Mm -hmm. So if you think about, you know, and people pull these numbers out of the air all the time. How many VMs can you run on top of bare metal? Sure. Maybe it's 10 to 1. Maybe it's 100. How many containers? Well, maybe it's 100 to 1,001. This microkernel, this unikernel stuff, it's another order of magnitude because you're losing that sort of Docker middleware. Yeah. And you're also not running full kernel. So they, every time they, somebody made an argument, why do you need to run a full OS for every app? Well, why do you need to run a full kernel, uh, you know, for this as well? Yeah, sure. And it's pretty good. And then when you refactor that, things like buffer overflows and stuff like that, you're basically in a random environment. So mm -hmm. you don't, you know, have a, a lot less chance of an application flaw from being, being explained. You get some natural separation of duty and stuff like that. And we just invested in one. Mm -hmm. We can't announce it uh, yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Docker, they actually bought a company, a, a very similar type of, uh, uh, you know, approach as well. So I think this is a really interesting uh, phenomenon, mm -hmm. which I really like because we haven't had a speed up in a while. Yeah. We had a slowdown, right? We had, um, uh, Spectre and Meltdown actually slowed things down for us, right? Sure. Especially virtual, that virtualized, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. So what I find really interesting as well as if we think about this is we have a lot of uh, organizations running COBOL today that are still trying to hire COBOL developers so that they can fix or refactor some of those applications. And we start to see generations of developers, generations of, of people that have worked on old platforms, so maybe Java, for example, that are retiring. It'll be very interesting to see especially as companies like, so for example, Docker with their enterprise edition actually has uh, some, some abilities that they market to convert existing applications into a container infrastructure. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see like how companies decide to do that, especially as, I, I mean, let's face it, the baby boom generation is starting to retire uh, and the generations that come after them are just less in terms of population, let alone developers or, or people of that kind of, I don't know, nature, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term. So it'll be really interesting to see the solutions that companies go to to help companies or organizations scale or maintain the scale that they've had with less, uh, both less architecture, less people, less, uh, you know, on, on less footprint in terms of actual servers in their environment. Yeah, my experience is taking an application and dockerizing it, as we, as we say, 
sounds really cool and then when you do it you're like wow that's a lot of work and it's <laughs> multiple iterations and you're constantly tweaking and you know i did the initial move made some improvements and i'll talk about my whole journey in, in my talk and then you know our developers have been making more improvements to uh further kind of tune down how, what's running in there to only what we need but that process took a year yeah and it's a very small application. I, I can imagine the level of effort for larger applications. Yeah, it's one thing to take an application like a web server mm -hmm. and Dockerize that, containerize it. So you get, I can maybe run more of those than I could, I could before. It's another thing entirely to take an API and think about taking that API as a, as a Docker, as like a microservice call versus you know a, another subset of Python or PHP or whatever, Java, that's running on my, on my app. And, and those two things, when people start talking about modernizing and people retiring, and, and it's, it's, it's really interesting to see where we're going um, because a lot of these applications that we have that are legacy are being subsumed, not necessarily by anything we're talking about, but by new SaaS apps, right? Mm -hmm. Why do I need to run a custom sharing, you know, a productivity communications platform that mm -hmm. was developed you know, over the last 10, 15 years when I can just use Google Hangouts or Slack or you know things right. like that. So I'm seeing a lot of organizations. If you talk to the CIO, um, they're giving reports to the board about security and compliance, but they're also giving reports to the board about modernizing. And I've actually seen you know presentations where, hey, we had 5,000 applications that we've created over the past 20 years. We're going to try to go to 600 mm -hmm. in the next five. Sure. You know, and that's that's a lot of complexity that gets dropped on the wayside, which is really good. Yeah, I, I think it's a daily conversation we have here about what services we're going to use to support the business and how much functionality we're going to build into our internal app. Um, I don't think that internal application development ever goes away. In, in my experience, we've got this internal app. It knows a lot about certain processes mm -hmm. and all that other external software would just take too long to implement and just doesn't have the metadata yeah. about our processes like that internal app does. And there's another, like we're talking about security, right? And everybody has this concept, I'm going to break into the application, I'm going to find vulnerabilities, what can I do to mitigate that? There's another kind of revolution going on in IT where when you're refactorizing these applications and pulling them together, you're talking about things like data dictionaries. You know, what does the word SKU mm -hmm. mean? Is it, is, it, is it a part number? Is it, a, is it, is it something here? And, and who's responsible for that? So a lot of organizations are thinking about who owns the life cycle of data? Because mm -hmm. um, when you start looking at regulations like on GDPR, mm -hmm. when you just look at the efficiency of doing things, if I've acquired two companies and I have to put them together, how do I manage all that? And that sometimes is actually, it, it's many times more important than uh, the actual security of these applications. Yep. Keith, more questions and for, for Ron along these lines? I, I was going to say, so it'd be really interesting to get your thoughts on um, Kind of where we're going as well so i know that uh, obviously at one point we were almost all bare metal and then virtualization came about and gave us an order of magnitude for uh new opportunities to run more software on the same hardware uh now docker containers are starting to to kind of break into that space but uh we recently got some emails about people asking about serverless and in my experience working in application security i find it interesting from the concept of eventually all vulnerabilities will just live in code more or less uh, so whether that's open source software uh, vulnerabilities that you need to be aware of or logic flaws or um, just functionality within the applications that it itself is, in fact, vulnerable to insecure direct object references or what have you. Um, what do you what do you see the next five or 10 years look like, Ron, from the perspective of as we move into micro, you know, microservices, whether that's a micro kernels or a unikernel environments? Um, when when does serverless become the big thing, and does that change the realm of security for everybody? It, it's uh, I think a lot of people are trying to predict this, and it's really really difficult. I actually thought with Spectre and Meltdown, we were going to see a lot of people sort of start pulling back from Amazon. People who are getting their bills and going, "Wow, it's twice as much this month." Right. You know, that's that's kind of an eye opener to a uh, to a lot of people. But having said that, the cost of refactoring applications is still, you know, the biggest limitation for, 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 for going out there. And things like GDPR and just, you know, where is my data, what kind of corporate governance, th those things are really, really doing that. Um, so I've seen Gartner, I've seen a lot of people talk about, you know, how many apps are going to be in the cloud versus, versus on-prem, hybrid data centers, you know, it, it, you know, it's really, really hard to do. What I see is when I talk to data center people, people who run data centers, they are like busy. We're opening up tons and tons of new ones. And most of these people aren't just housing, you know, Google and, and, and Amazon. They're housing, 
like corporations, I, I, I don't want to say specifically, but, but brands that we are aware mm -hmm. of have these huge data centers and they're all about application consolidation and not necessarily you know, going all the way to, uh, to, to, to Amazon. Where I think the Amazon guys are, are, are going to be great is like you know, the next 10 Ubers. You know, startup companies who have, uh, Netflix, right? Huge need to have elasticity, huge need to, to do that. But if you're a bank, I don't think you have a huge need for elasticity. You know, your website is probably going to be fine at peak or at not peak, and I don't think it's going to make a difference. It's not like Netflix where you have to, you're Stream dropping. Data. Yeah, yeah, you're not dropping, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, the airline industry. I mean, can you do some sur surging during peak travel days? Sure. sure. I, I don't, it's not the same level of magnitude. And when I talk to these people and I say, elasticity because I've heard all the talks mm -hmm. that we've heard they're like yeah no no it's just, that's just a busy day for us you know it's not right. a, it's not a big deal so so when you say long term you know how big is is uh, serverless and how far are we going to go I think it really depends about you know if that becomes the coding standard like right now when you talk to a developer who comes out of a university they tend to know Java mm -hmm. so Java tends to be the things you can hire for and develop for and the good thing about Java is you can code on-prem and you can code in, 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 in the cloud I think if Amazon you know, started doing things that were only in Amazon programming language, which sounds far-fetched now, but mm -hmm. five years from now it might, but wow, Ron said that, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it might, it might go down that, that, that road. Uh, even with uh, Google, you know, with their Go, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Go app, I see people, oh, I can't do Go. Look, you, you, you can learn that in five minutes. It's not a, it's not a big deal. And um, so we'll see, see where that goes. Now, what I think is really interesting about serverless, though, is not only how do I audit my vulnerabilities, but how does somebody audit me? And, and that's going to be really, really difficult the more we get, um, more that our data and our applications are basically part of our supply chain. Mm -hmm. So right now, if you asked a company, you know, are you secure? Hey, we did a pen test. Great. Well, how do you do that when, you know, that API might be hanging out directly on Amazon? You can't just scan it. You don't have permission to do it. They might not even know where it is or how to get to it, right? So how do you have transparency and auditing when you have all that stuff in the future. And we're starting to see glimmers of that in the industry today. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, going back to the days of bare metal, and you were a pen tester back in the day, I've spent some time pen testing as well, you assess the operating system, and then you discover that, oh, MySQL's running on top of the operating system, so we can look at that configuration, we can look at the database security, and how all that ties together, and you controlled everything from bare metal all the way up to the, the application. Now we're like, well, we'll just take our, our MySQL database and we're just dropping that at Amazon. And like, here's our schema and our data. And that's what we control is our schema and our data, maybe some configuration. How do you audit that now? You can't audit the underlying operating system unless you have permission from Amazon. And what's, what's really interesting is not only can you not audit it, but you have to ask, but you're still liable. You're still um, sort of on the hook to ask questions about that. And we're seeing companies like CyberGRX come yeah, out yeah. that basically try to almost take from a crowdsourcing point of view, ask those questions, be like Salesforce and Amazon and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, Workday and, and, and just thousands of other applications to kind of get that information. And the other hand, we're seeing companies like Risk Recon, mm -hmm. which actually are scanning, you know, doing that like Shodan type scan on the perimeter and saying, well, you know, there's some TLS hanging out there. There's, um, you know, Apache Struts too, which hasn't been patched yet. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a false positive, maybe it's a backported, but it's, hey, it's, we want to tell you this might be indicative of a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the world we're heading into. It's, it's, getting, um, it's getting really interesting. Now, Ron, what about being tied to the cloud platform? I mean, I, I get concerned about that and really the driver for us internally, to give an example, we had a development and production system, bare metal here in the studio, Development system, hard drive crashes, right? It was like the one drive in the whole place that wasn't solid state and it crashed. And so we made the decision, let's move up into Amazon. And we said, well, to ease the transition, we should just use the Amazon data. Is it R RDS? Did I get mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. RDS. RDS. Yeah. And we're going to use RDS. And we're like, well, that takes away a lot of maintenance for us. We It's easy to deploy. We have multiple instances. It's backed up. But... Now I'm kind of stuck with Amazon, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm using their service. My app is all configured for their service. Is it a problem for companies to be stuck? Or does that differ by vertical in, in your goals as a company? Yeah, the story I love to tell there is, um, I think when, I think pen testing has had several renaissances, right? But in the, in, in the early 2000s, you know, there was a lot of people trying to knock over ex exchange servers because everybody has an exchange server. That's the, and for people who don't know what exchange is, this is what Microsoft sold before Office 365, right? This was right. the server on your network. 
and, and you have that server and oh, email can't go down. That's a critical app, mm -hmm. right? So you got to have two of these servers. Mm -hmm. Well, now you got to synchronize them. Well, now you have to like store the data somewhere and, and that's a huge thing. How long are you going to store that email for? Oh, by the way, um, VPN people got to get it. So you got to put some VPN in front mm -hmm. of that. Um, you got to put authentication on that. You got to put antivirus on that. You got to um, maybe do some DR failover stuff. And you look at this and you're like, holy cow. That's like an amazing complex thing just to get email mm -hmm. to everybody's phone and desktop and 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 that in OWA and those sort of ex people need the web access ex exactly so right or now you can just go to Office 365 in the cloud and basically get that service and Microsoft all they do is try to make sure that that service doesn't go down mm -hmm. and I think you know who's going to do a better job are you going to do a better job you might. And it, are you going to have a competitive advantage if you do it, you know, nine 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 times better <laughs> yeah, than, yeah. than than Microsoft? Splitting hairs at that point. I don't I think, think so, right? Yeah. So, so I think from that point of view, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, you know, if you're Netflix, and for some reason, and I forget if Netflix is still on Amazon or or, or uh, Rackspace or whatever. I think they've moved away. I, yeah, I think, I, I think built they built their own architecture. Yeah. And it's always interesting hearing why they did and didn't and, 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 and whatnot. And I, th I think all these video game companies mm -hmm. who are all in with Amazon and then they get out and, and I think Riot was, was in and out. I, I, I'm not as up on what they're doing specifically. It's really interesting why. Like what wall did they run into? Was mm -hmm. it a cost problem? Was it a reliability problem? Was it a, a compliance problem? You really, we don't have that sort of nuance today. But for you guys, you know, for where you're, where you're at right here, you think about where you're at. You're sort of tied to the electrical system of the, the, the local population here. You're, you're tied to the, the internet infrastructure here. Does it make sense to go to a data center? Sure. Could you go to the Amazon? Sure. Are you, you know, do we really want to get into your personal, how, how fail over are you? You guys have a great podcast. It's probably perfect for that from a risk reward point of view. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm CNN, I've invested tremendously in Akamai which is another form of distributed thing. And then anytime you invest in, in an infrastructure like that, that's a point of attack, it's a point of failure. If somebody wants to come after us, you know, all you have to do is see the presentations from Cloudflare about all the times people have you know, stopped those kind of attacks, DDoSes right. and whatnot. That reliability does create a dependency, but I think it's, people just have to be aware of these things. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, Paul, it makes me wonder as well if, uh, if there's room for opportunity for companies to come into existence that um, build kind of like a middleware layer that allows you to transition between cloud providers um, somewhat ad hoc as you need to, right? So rather than just having a uh, failover inside of Amazon, you have failover into Azure through this kind of third party like API type uh, application, right? So now you only have to build to function with that middleware and that middleware can put your uh, architecture wherever it needs to be for failover purposes. I mean, I always think of uh, US East 1 seems to go down with mm -hmm. enough regularity to be concerned uh, for Amazon's side of things. And, and so to that end, those companies that rely on it might have a few hours of downtime and that could be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of value lost for that company, depending on who you are. Uh, but to that end, if you have an easy failover outside of your current cloud provider uh, through some sort of middleware, that sounds like a lot of room for opportunity as we develop going forward. I'd be surprised if some of those companies didn't exist today. There, there's a number of them, but I, th I think where we're heading when you start thinking about um, like serverless security and the ability to process uh, things like credit cards. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people will process credit cards cheaper than somebody else, but maybe that's not as secure or there's not as transparent. So the question is, is you know, do you want to have the same thing for your mail? Do you want to have the same thing for your um, other types of applications? There's so many companies that have popped up today that focus on certain types of, of, uh, of, of APIs and, and, uh, and, and services. So um, is this going to happen? Yes. And what's going to happen is when people start drawing on their network, they're not going to draw routers and switches. They're going to say, well, this, this, this class of APIs comes from this vendor. This class of APIs, it's Datadog. Everything feeds into them. This class of APIs. So then if you said, how do I attack or audit that? That's going to get really interesting. Yeah. Well, and, and even the skills of the IT security staff and developers how do I do what I did before in this new serverless mm -hmm. architecture? How does it translate? I mean, some things translate, but a lot yeah. of things don't. So I'll, so I'll give you a couple kind of insights. So I get a lot of pitches mm -hmm. from, uh, uh, from people, and, and it used to be about three or four years ago, every startup I talked to, oh, we're on, we're on the cloud. What does that mean? Well, we're on Amazon. We have an Amazon solution. Okay. And it was, they were locked in. They, not only was the app designed for Amazon, there was no way to do it on-prem. And there was no way to kind of move it to Google because they used Amazon APIs, Amazon databases, things like that. And, and 
I'm not seeing that now. Now what I'm seeing is if they're locked into anything, they're locked into Office 365 Azure. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason is because most corporations are on Office 365 for email. If I trust them enough to hold my email, I probably trust them yeah. enough to host my security app. <clears throat> Whereas on the Amazon side, it was kind of a barrier to entry. If I can't run it on-prem or I, I, I'm locked into Amazon, that was a tough uh, thing for a lot of large enterprises to, uh, to swallow. Do you find that a lot of companies do have the cloud offering as well as the on-premise? I do. Um, today. Today. So if you're going to RSA and, and you meet a company and they say we're in the cloud, you need to ask them, do you have an on-prem solution? And hopefully that on-prem solution isn't just like a proxy to their cloud yeah. solution, right? Like 100% no DNS, no internet connected, can you run you know, on-prem? And this is actually, if it's not a design requirement up front, it's really hard to do if you're tied to these Amazon APIs. And I, I want to pick on Amazon, it could be Google, mm -hmm. it could be Racktop, it could be Rackspace, um, it could be any, any of that kind of stuff. So we're seeing that, um, but the question is, is what is the app? Like if your app is a internet monitoring service that's aggregating things like, I don't know, DNS queries and hashes, it makes a lot of sense to put that because your service is, that yeah. and and when you look at how hard something like a virus total is which is now chronicle mm -hmm. and then you compare it to something like a reversing labs and you realize that what reversing labs offers you can buy an on-prem copy of mm -hmm. what those things that's that's the kind of thing you want to talk about you get all the benefits of the cloud and if you want to pay for privacy you want to pay for the on-prem version you can sort of spend a little bit more and uh, and get the same user experience. That's the trend I'm seeing too. Is mm -hmm. pay for privacy is yeah. the, the best way. Uh, and inter interestingly, the way that people are doing that too is uh, is either they're Dockerizing it, right? They're building it out as a microservices thing that you can deploy inside of your own data center or your own environment, uh, or they're writing it to be cross-platform. So they're writing it with things like, uh, ironically, Electron. Uh, so for example, Slack today is written in Electron so that it can be everywhere without a whole lot of you know porting it across operating systems. So. Um, it will be interesting to see how things like microservices and Docker and unikernels um, allow for the ability to not only have uh, in-cloud options or offerings available to you, but then in your own data center offerings or in your own network offerings as well. Um, so that'll be it's going to be an interesting world to see from a development standpoint how security fits in from the configuration side of it. I think that more and more over the next several years, what will happen is security professionals won't be an entirely separate department. It'll be uh, ambassadors into different development groups because at, at that point, there will be no more firewall. It'll be a zero trust network and you have to secure it at the application. So you're, you're absolutely right. I'm, the trend I'm seeing is that most people who are doing security are going to become risk managers. They're going to be able to try to understand the risk communicate that to the executives, and then try to come up with ways to mitigate that. And it could be, gee, we're not going to do this on-prem anymore. We are going to go to the cloud. The cloud's going to do a better job than we could have done in, in, in internally. Mm -hmm. For other applications, maybe it makes more sense to do it ourselves. And uh, that's going to be very interesting to, to, to talk about. And what I, what I find interesting is we spent most of this conversation talking about deployment. Mm -hmm. you know, on-prem, is it bare metal, is it cloud, is it serverless? We haven't said two things about finding vulnerabilities. Yeah, well, that was actually my next question well, was this alphabet soup that we have yeah. of web application protection, dynamic scanning, static scanning, RASP, yep. uh, IAST. It's an alphabet soup. I find many in the community are very confused mm -hmm. by it and don't know where yeah. to go. So what's your advice on these protection technology? Well, it's identification of vulnerabilities and potentially p protection yep. uh, as well that are rolled yeah. into one. What I want to do is I want to take all the developers who are working on AI and just take away their computers. <laughs> That's my solution right <laughs> That's now. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Problem yeah. solved. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but the joke is actually very important. We have not solved secure programming. And there's great, you know, Veracode. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who can audit code really good. I, I was a big customer of, 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 of there's a ton of ways that we found stuff, even mm -hmm. though we had processes in place, right? You always find stuff. Did developers learn to trust the tool or... I find that that's often where it falls down yeah. with static yeah. analysis tools is the developers, much like they won't trust QA, will also not trust tools that give them erroneous reports. I, exactly. It's a culture thing. And if you talk about, I, I want to do anything to impact the developer's work environment, their, their IDE, yeah. I want to change their language, I want to look over their shoulder while they're typing, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. And there's great, you know, you got Synopsys, you got all these different companies out there who are doing, uh, you know, different things. And they all know that, that at the end of the day, they're making a difference. If you code some things, they're going to find it. Mm -hmm. But there's no holy grail yet about f 
stopping and finding all there's just too many use cases and um, so which I think is interesting is if, if you stop with source code auditing well if you start there you know so what's the next thing right well you can actually do the runtime stuff right this is one of the reasons we invested in in, in, in contrast and the thing I like about that is you you're really close to the developer they can give the feedback to the developer but you know developers don't always know how their software is used and and if, if anything I was successful it was because I always went and ran all, all the software that I was involved in and I could see how it actually ran on my home network mm -hmm. on a customers network a lot of times developers don't have that luxury they, they they really don't so the thing I like about rasp is they can get that feedback contrast has done a decent job there's other solutions out there but they've done a really decent job of sort of bringing that developer into the loop uh, if, if you will and I think um, I think some of the, the um, companies who do the, the sourcing do that as well. Like I know White Ops, uh, White Hat did that for a while. Try to get that in there, teach them and how to how to do the right coding, give them that feedback in real time. Mm -hmm. How do you? And, and Paul, we've talked. I was Sorry, gonna, I, gonna I was going to ask a performance question on a lot of these technologies. I think one of the primary uh, or main ob uh, objections that I get when we talk about. Um, specifically RASP and other technologies that have to live in, inside or alongside of the web application is how does it impact performance? So I, I was going to do a blog on all the ways I can install software on an endpoint and not call it an agent. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's an application that's injected. It's, it's a microservice. It's a, um, it's a software sensor, you know, it's, it's, it's a hook. It's, yeah. yeah. And, and even when, um, so a long time ago, before I even did Network Security Wizards, mm -hmm. I was at US Inter Networking, and I wanted to install, install a, a Schmitty tap, you know, so I could yep. get packets mm -hmm. off the network without touching anything, like a switch or, or anything. And even that was changed, right? So any time you introduce something to the network, it's a potential point of failure, mm -hmm. potential point of performance impact, and if anything goes wrong, it's a potential blame. Yeah. Point as well. Yeah. So even if somebody said it's zero latency, zero impact, it'll actually add CPUs to your cycle. You know, it's still a hard sell because you're introducing a uh, a, a change after it's been designed. Yes. So it's a hard thing. Now I've seen people say, oh, you know, RASP is one to two percent. What in memory and CPU and web, you know, renderings? That's that's it depends very much on the application and. and sure. There's a lot of. Yeah. I mean, uh, ironic kind of term, but there's a lot of variables there. Mm -hmm. A lot of variables, a lot so. of variables. And, and that's one of my favorite questions to ask salespeople. What's the performance impact? You know, mm -hmm. just, oh, there's no performance impact. Oh, great. <laughs> what if I run two of them side by side? Right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, also the ease of deployment and, and no performance impact and having a lightweight agent is something that I think every vendor is saying today. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard to kind of cut through that noise and, and figure yeah. out who's yeah. doing uh, actually solving your problem. Yeah. And what I think is interesting is when you look at data monitoring, I just want to collect everything. Everything you can get from Amazon, everything you can get from Google, and bring all this data back. The RASPs actually can give you visibility into the application that you didn't, maybe you didn't code in there. You know, when you look at applications written in like uh, Go, for example, there's a lot of default logging, a lot of default kind of APIs that maybe people are taking advantage of, maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I like about the RASPs is you get a nice audit trail. So that if you do have to do an instant response, you actually have something to work with right, right. away. And that's a great use case for, for, for RASP. All I have to do is say, hey, it's my forensics audit trail. Doom, done. Mm -hmm. You know, people, are, people will be willing to take a performance hit for that, um, especially in light of uh, Equifax and, and um, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Sure, sure. Keith? And Paul, I was going to add as well, um, with DevOps as a process, right, the faster you can get feedback to the developer and across the development teams, if you have multiple, the better, right? So uh, things like RASP, which are great for a logging and monitoring perspective, can give you rapid feedback in production as to how your application is being uh, used or utilized. And that is the exact sort of thing that a technical program manager or an application security engineer can make use of to say, Okay, we have to, you know, schedule in some unplanned time to go and address a series of problems in the application now, um, which is is huge from a fast kind of fast failure model of DevOps to figure out what's working, what's not, what do we need to fix right now, uh, and then iterate. Right, so it's a, a learning opportunity as much as it is a security opportunity. Yeah, and if you're a big enterprise and you've got a an app, you know, I, I'm I'm the Fandango app that's buying tickets to the new mm -hmm. Avengers movie, right? Um, you know. I probably have a production one and I probably have a, a, a QA one. So you start with RASP at the QA and you simulate yeah. that. And then when you go into production, you know, if you're not containerized and dockerized and using elasticity, you're probably doing traditional load balancing. And if you've got 20 or 30 web servers that are processing all these things, 
you put you know the rasp on one of those first mm -hmm. and you get to see what happens first but and that so it's a pretty easy way to get get in there sure. uh, what, what i'll tell you this is i've talked to customers who've deployed rasp and once they sort of get that religion it becomes part of the culture yeah and it's all about changing mm -hmm. that and it's the same thing as like okay if we added you know vericode into our rde after a while you change the culture so anybody who's having an objection they need to think a longer term game about how do i change the culture of my organization to embrace these kind of technologies and that's often the hardest thing when you implement security hard. products that's right, right. It's changing, that's right changing the culture and the, and the best way to change culture is with a podcast a coffee and a cigar that's right, right. <laughs> i like how you title that back <laughs> together so ron um obviously you've been invested in some companies that uh are in the application security space mm -hmm. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to, to talk about what impressed you about some of the companies that you've invested in that can help our audience here on Application Security Weekly. Yeah, so I got to start off with, with, with Tenable, right? Tenable, I'm not an investor, but, but you know, you start off with the ability of discovering everything on your network, both passive and active. They made a lot of advances in web application. They have a lot of advances in, in uh, container auditing, which, mm -hmm. is, which, which is good. You move out of that, our first real investment uh, in that space was Contrast. Again, it was mm -hmm. that, that runtime. We talked a good bit about Contrast. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is, is Stackrocks. Mm -hmm. And Stackrocks, 100% container monitoring. And they're very, very focused on that. And again, if you're looking at other companies, some companies do you know, web app scanning, container monitoring, and, and we'll talk about serverless in a minute. But Stackrocks is very focused on that full stack auditing of your container infrastructure. So, so discovery, anomalies, you know, auditing for vulnerabilities, uh, looking for, 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 for buffer overflows, looking for containers that are talking to each other that don't normally talk to each other. Uh, really, really good, well-funded, doing, doing really well. Now you move away from containers and you start talking about serverless. Mm. And again, there's companies out there that do serverless and containers and you know, vuln scanning and whatnot. But we invest in this company called Pertigo, which basically is focused on, uh, on, on Lambda right now. And it's, it's the same kind of security model. Let's discover all your APIs. Mm -hmm. Discover all the, the vulnerabilities associated with those APIs. So a little bit of source code auditing there. Let's talk about the permissions. You know, does this API have an S3 bucket? Does the code even reference the S3 bucket, right? right? Is there an API that hasn't been called? Why is it there? Who has the permission to do that? And then on top of that, monitor for attacks and vulnerabilities. So I've obviously had the approach of, I want to have very discreet things. I, I'll have companies that pitched me and said, hey, we do everything. Yeah. You know, we do, we do the container auditing. Uh, we do the assessment of um, maybe the configuration of the interface of, of like AWS. I'm like, yeah, no, it's Tenable does that, right? And, and that's, that's a pretty uh, uh, common thing that people are doing uh, sure. today. So that's kind of the way we, we do that. And then the other area, one we have in that space is, is this uh, uh, a unikernel uh, uh, company, which I can't really talk about just yet, but I kind of really see that um, as, a, uh, as, as I think that's going to be one of the bigger trends coming back into the data center, having full control over my uh, compute and infrastructure. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Keith, uh, any final questions for Ron? So uh, I guess just to kind of wrap back on the one unikernel thing, just to make sure that I, I get it in for the audience as well. It sounds like the unikernel to me is almost like containerizing the kernel in the way that the container uh, model contains the operating system. So rather than having the full access to the operating system or the full access to the kernel, it's, it's literally just the access that you need and no more, um, which sounds like a whole different set of uh, unique uh, solutions that can come about as, as a result of that. Am I understanding that correctly, Ron? So it's actually a full kernel. And, and when I say full kernel, okay. it's, it's, a limited, it's a limited kernel. So it's not like okay, a got it. permissions of a process. So to the point where if you remove network connectivity from one of these things, and all your communications in and out over, over serial connections or USB or, or something like that, there's no network. If, if you broke into this, you're, you're not going to get a network connection gotcha. uh, out of it. Yeah. So it really creates a lot more opportunities to, to segment your back end and um, you know, have, have, have anybody who's attempting to, um, actually you can't even run the code to do it. So it's pretty easy to separate these things and keep them um, uh, running, which is, which is good. That's awesome. Well, Ron, thank you very much for appearing on Application Security thank Weekly. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and watching. Keith, I know you have your, your typical uh, closing line, so I'm going to turn it over to you <laughs> to end the show. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you everyone for listening to Application Security Weekly. Uh, thank you again for enjoying uh, this interview segment with Ron Gula. I appreciate you coming on the show. Remember to get commit and stay classy.